Welcome to Bob's Coffee Chat. Today's guest presenter is Sandy Rosenthal, author of four-time award-winning book, Words Whispered in Water, Why the Levees Broke in Hurricane Katrina. After Hurricane Katrina and the levee breaches in New Orleans, Sandy Rosenthal became a citizen investigator and founder of the nonprofit levees.org with 25,000 supporters nationwide. Her 2020 book, Words Whispered in Water, is about how she exposed the culprit in the levee breach disaster, the Army Corps of Engineers, and how the agency spent millions covering up its mistakes and fooling the American public. Rosenthal is an advocate for the 62% of the American population living by levees. When Rosenthal is not advocating for safe levees, she plays tennis, practices yoga, and spends time with her two grandchildren in San Francisco. Welcome to Bob's Coffee Chat, Sandy. Please tell us your story. Th thanks so much. And I am going to begin by giving everybody a gift that they can use at any time they're watching, any time they're on Zoom and watching a presentation, which is what we're going to do in just the next couple of minutes. So the first thing I'm going to do is share my PowerPoint with you all. Okay, I look like I'm gonna to have to put my glasses on for a moment. Okay, it says host has disabled screen sharing. So host, you need to enable screen sharing, please. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on a second. How's that going? Let's, let's try again. Okay, I've just shared my PowerPoint. And if you all will look up uh, by the way, this is this is for those of you who are at a laptop or a desktop. Okay, it doesn't work for an iPhone. So, but, but I know that a majority of people these days are, are on a laptop or a desktop. So, if you look at the top of your screen right now, you'll see a green bar that says you are viewing Sandy's screen. Okay, and if you look on the right hand side of that green bar, there's a little black box. So using your, your, your um, keypad or your mouse, click on it. A drop-down menu is going to appear. And the very bottom option of that drop-down menu says side-by-side -side mode. Click on it. Okay, and voila, boom. You're going to have two screens. The screen will split in two, and you're going to see my PowerPoint on one side, and you're going to see me on the other. Now, if you see me and only me, you're good. Okay, just, just, just hold on for just a, a few seconds. But if you see a whole bunch of other people, that's not good. I mean, why do you need to see everybody right now? The only person you should be looking at right now is me, 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 especially since I can't be there with you in person. So what you need to do is take using your keypad or your mouse, go on up to the right hand, upper right hand side of your screen and click on speaker view. Uh, it might be for some of you, it might say side by side speaker view. Okay, but you need to click on speaker view. view. The only person you should see on the right is me. Okay. Now, one last little thing that even my amazing techie daughter didn't know until I showed this to her just last week when I was in San Francisco. If you look at the box with my head in it, okay, on the left-hand side of that box, I guess that's over here, on the left-hand side of the box is two little white lines, okay? Again, using your keypad or your mouse, hover your cursor on those little white lines and you can move the white lines back and forth and you can make my PowerPoint bigger or you can make my PowerPoint smaller. I want you to make the PowerPoint um, just big enough that you can see it, okay? But, um, Oops, end of slide. So let me hold on one second. I want you to uh, make it. I see what I did wrong. Uh, so I'd, I'd like you, if you can, if you've gotten to that point, make the PowerPoint as small as you can and still be able to read it and make my head as big as you can. Since I can't be there with you, at least um, this is the next best thing. Okay. Well, enough of that. Um, this, that's my gift to you that you can use every, any time that you look at a PowerPoint or any sort of presentation on a Zoom. Okay, words whispered in water. Always beware when anyone blames catastrophe or mayhem 
on wind and water because human beings are always hiding behind those words. If you didn't know it until today, you're going to find out right now. In New Orleans, levees are designed and built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That's the way it's been since 1965. But after that levee breach disaster in 2005, the Army Corps of Engineers blamed anyone or anything except itself. And I'm positive that's what you all heard, okay? Keep in mind, this is no small disaster. In fact, disaster is the wrong word. It's a catastrophe. Uh, in disaster management studies, it's a catastrophe. 1,577 plus people dead, $170 billion damage adjusted for inflation. It's a catastrophe. And here we are, the Army Corps of Engineers is refusing to answer any questions until the studies are completed. Well, this is 350 square miles of flooded area, 53 breaches. You, you, you don't, the studies aren't completed overnight. It took nine months for the first studies to come out. And it was during that critical time in our nation's history where the entire nation was engaged, the whole world was engaged, but definitely this country was engaged in this breach event in New Orleans and all that flooding. And during that critical time, the American people heard mainly three reasons for the flooding, heard a bunch, but mainly these three. Monster storm. Well, in Mississippi, Katrina was a monster storm, but not in New Orleans. It was only about maybe a cat one. So, well, you know, New Orleans is all below sea level, 20 feet below sea level. Well, actually, no. First of all, 50% of New Orleans is at or well above sea level. And the lowest areas are maybe 10 feet below sea level. And you can see those lowest levels on here, the areas in red. Oh, and you know, they're all corrupt down there. That was the third main thing you probably heard. And, and I know you heard that. We're all corrupt. It must, must be our fault, right? Well, and the problem is that was all pretty believable. I mean, the Army Corps of Engineers, I mean, they, th these are the people have been around for 200 years. They're the gold standard. They've built tens of thousands of miles of levees along the Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio rivers, capable of withstanding surge heights like you see here, surge heights of 20 feet or more for 30 days or more every single year. And those levees don't break. Well, actually, lately, some of them are broken. But by 2005, these levees were not breaking. Keep in mind that the levees that broke in New Orleans and flooded us out were drainage canals. They were only supposed to hold a few feet of water for a few hours. Well, uh, at, so after the breach event, you know, fairy tales. And in my mind, a big breakthrough happened, certainly for me, when I got my hands on this testimony four weeks after the flooding um, to the government accountability office. And right there, as clear as day, it says the Army Corps is responsible for project design and construction and local interests are responsible for maintenance. Well, and meanwhile, keep in mind, the levees that broke were the newest ones. They were only completed in 2000, okay? They were five years old. So in my mind, if a brand new five-year-old building crashed to the ground, you wouldn't blame the janitor. You'd blame, you'd look to the engineer, the architect and the contractor. And in the case of the Army Corps of Engineers, they're all three of those things. So I founded the, levy, the, the group levies.org and started asking lots of questions when meanwhile, all those fairy tales were flying all over the country. Well, immediately I got pushback immediately from guess who? The Army Corps of Engineers. And I also got pushback from the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is an elite trade group uh, in America. It's actually an international group. And I also had a lot of pushback from the media um, who either ignored me or pushed back. So all of this has reinforced my theory. I, I, I knew I was onto something, okay? That the Army Corps had to be at least partly to blame and that had, it had allied itself with that engineering uh, trade group and the, Amer the engineering establishment to rewrite history and fool the American public. Meanwhile, there was a lawsuit forming, okay? That might've had something to do with all that pushback. Well, one of the first things my group did is we noticed that cozy relationship between the Army Corps and that trade group so we created a video that spoofed that cozy relationship. 
it's a one minute video. It's available on YouTube. It's hysterical. We, these are high school kids. And well, it turned up the trade group did not enjoy that criticism. And they sent me this letter on a Saturday morning, which if, any, if there are any attorneys in the group, you'll recognize it immediately. It's legalese for if you don't shut your mouth, we will sue you. It's something that big organizations are doing every day, threatening little groups or, or little people with lawsuits. So fortunately, there are wonderful lawyers in the world. And uh, one of those groups is Cooley, uh, the Silicon Valley firm Cooley, who, who called me up Thanksgiving Day and uh, said, uh, we will represent you in your, um, in, your, in your exercise of free speech. And, the, and what ended up happening is the ASCE withdrew their threat the trade group withdrew their threat and levy.org announced this in a very, very well attended press event, which was all very embarrassing for the, for the trade group and for the Army Corps. So over the next three years, we're continuing to shine the light, you know, it's the best disinfectant. And we put up historic plaques at, at major breach sites. Uh, this is the 17th Street Canal is what you saw earlier in this, uh, in this presentation, that was the 17th Street Canal. We pushed for federal reform of the Army Corps of Engineers. And we also caught the Army Corps of Engineers uh, harassing me and my group online, which was very embarrassing for the Corps. We did it using IP addresses, which is kind of like caller ID. And that, was a, that was a very embarrassing and important chapter in my group's history. Well, anyway, moving along quickly, because we don't have much time. By 2011, um, I, I, uh, I had uh, a lot of advisors and one of them was somebody who, who an engineer who worked on the 9-11 commission. Well, he contacted me and suggested nominating breach site to the National Register of Historic Places. And which makes sense because these, this breach event was a historic event that actually changed America as we know it. And the majority of the American population lives in counties protected by levies. So all of this made a whole lot of sense. And in the process of working on the nomination, uh, I had to read all the reports, all of them, not just the ones that came out in 06, but I had to read out all the most recent, read the most recent ones. And I discovered information in those reports buried deep and like page 200 that was missing from the executive summary, important information. And um, I also found it, that this information was um, uh, information that was in the executive summaries that wasn't in the body of the paper. But anyway, the, the moral of the story is you got to read the report. And at the end of the day, when I was done reading all those reports, I realized the Army Corps of Engineers is singularly responsible, not the any local corruption, not the geography of the city, and certainly not the storm, which was wasn't even enough to not the papaya out of my papaya trees, okay? It wasn't a strong storm in New Orleans, but that fairy tale was common household knowledge all over the country by 2011. So what do you do? Well, you know the old saying, keep your enemies close? It was my enemies that, sh that showed me by accident what the solution was. And the solution was, all my enemies and detractors were quoting the UC Berkeley conclusion, which was the first report that was ever released. And to be fair to the good people of UC, UC Berkeley, it was you know, by definition the first report. They didn't have access to other reports. It was published um, under an uh, insane deadline and a shoestring budget. What could go wrong? Well, this is what went wrong. They had a wrong conclusion. This is their conclusion, it's right here. The Corps had tried for years to put gates at the drainage canal that would have kept water out of the city. That would have been the superior solution, but the local levy board and the local water board prevented installation of those gates. That's the story. And I bet some of you have heard that, okay? Except it's not true. It's a fairy tale, but, but what do you do? So fortunately, the uh, UC Berkeley co-chairs understood the, this, this, this conundrum, they understood. And so we, my organization brought that wrong conclusion to their attention and they offered to write a whole new report that would retract the wrong conclusion and replace it with the right conclusion. And that ended up getting published in 2015 in this Water Policy Official Journal of the World Water Council. And that new conclusion is 
that the Corps had made a tragic mistake when they were looking for ways to save money in the 1980s. They were behind schedule and they needed to get moving. So they, um, and costs were rising and they were looking for ways to save money. Nothing wrong with that. But they wrongly concluded that they only needed to drive steel sheet pilings into the ground 16 feet instead of 46. And when Hurricane Katrina's storm surge arrived, moderate surge, wasn't even that high, it was enough to knock over those walls. So a story about the New Journal article was in the New York Times in um, May of um, 2015. And after that, after the journal article and the newspaper article, all the major media stopped promoting that fairy tale. So that's good. That was a big, big improvement. No one got a dime from that lawsuit, by the way. It was dismissed by the Flood Control Act of 1928 because the Corps is immune from lawsuit should its flood protection project fail. But at least the people of New Orleans could throw off their cloak of shame that they've been forced to wear for a decade. So why should California care about any of this? Well, again, two thirds of the country lives by levees. And right after our big disaster, California stood up and went, whoa, because California thought it was the locals' fault. So California um, looked at their local levee boards and said, we need to do a better job. And they passed a historic fleet of bills and they now require their levy board uh, members to have expertise in hydrology and engineering. And all these things are good. There's nothing wrong with these things. Furthermore, California designated a billion dollars of its own state money in making sure that their levies are up to par. Um, And uh, and currently in in the the more populous areas of California, like Sacramento, uh, they, the, uh, your Congress people are, are trying to get 200 year protection, which is much better protection than the standard 100 year protection that the whole rest of the country has, including New Orleans. I want to point, I want to mention just a couple of things about your flood insurance. Okay, new flood insurance rates are going to come out in October. And uh, as we discussed earlier, when we were waiting to start, uh, there was a drought in California for four years. I don't have the dates in front of me, but so for four years, California put in a billion dollars into the flood insurance program with only 20 million of payouts. So because of that, partly because of that, two thirds of the policy holders in California are going, may see a decrease. Okay, that's good. Uh, the flood prone Russian river may see an increase, but we'll know for sure when all that comes out. I have a link right here. I created this handy dandy link that you could write down and you could get a lot more information about that. I'll also put the link in the chat box later if you don't have a pen. Okay, so that concludes uh, my talk. I hope I've uh, piqued your interest and uh, hopefully you'll have some questions because in my mind, that's the best part. I'm gonna go ahead and stop share and open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. That was a very insightful uh, presentation, Sandy. And 